Hello there, it's Andy Parks from the Washington Times, and I'll be joined by Stephen Dynan, Washington Times Assistant Managing Editor, right after this. You know, as a listener to my podcast, you qualify to receive a 50% discount on an annual digital subscription to the Washington Times. That's right. Simply go to WashingtonTimes.com slash Andy. That's WashingtonTimes.com slash A-N-D-Y. And now, as promised, Washington Times Assistant Managing Editor, Stephen Dynan. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Andy. All right, got a couple of questions here for you. First of all, I saw your exclusive go up just a couple of hours ago. House GOP probes historically low ICE arrest after Biden policy changes. So rather than abolishing ICE, Biden just simply changed the rules? Yeah, this has been sort of a, uh, a suspicion for among Republicans and some immigration enforcement advocates for a while that, you know, that we, we saw the push for abolish ICE from a few years ago and that <laughs> as a slogan didn't prove too popular. And so instead, what the Biden administration has done, according to these Republicans, is that they have issued memos basically slashing into ICE's ability to do its job. So ICE still exists. The agency still exists. It's just doing a whole lot less than it used to do under Bush, Obama, and Trump. They described it uh, in, in this letter I obtained. It's basically abolishment through memorandum rather than actually going to Congress and, and cutting off funding. They've just issued rules that restrict ISIS, at least the deportation and the illegal immigrant arrest operations that restrict them to the point where it's essentially abolishment by memorandum. Now, it's a bit of a hyperbole. Of course, ICE is still doing some enforcement, but, you know, according to the numbers that we have been reporting on over the last year, it's they're they're operating at about a quarter of the capacity that they were under the Trump administration pre-pandemic, and they're operating at an eighth of the capacity that they were in the peak years under the Obama administration. So uh, ICE has not been abolished. It does still exist and is still doing operations. It's just it's minuscule compared to what the resources it has should allow. Anyone challenge the ruling by the Biden administration? Yeah, there's actually a, an ongoing court case. So the, it gets complicated. We're, we're actually on our third iteration of the non-enforcement constraint rules from the, the Biden administration. The first ones were issued by the acting Homeland Security Secretary on Inauguration Day. And then the ICE, acting ICE director issued updated rules in February. And then new Secretary Mayorkas issued full rules in uh, September, limiting who ICE could actually target for deportation. All of those are being challenged in a couple of different cases, but in particular, one case in Texas has the the furthest. And we're actually going to, there's going to be a trial very soon. I actually just this week uh, saw that they had filed the witness lists and exhibit lists uh, that they that the Texas charge along with Louisiana. Uh, they filed those lists of witnesses that they expect to call and the documents that they expect to refer to. So it's, it's, it's going to be a really fascinating test. Biden administration must prove, first of all, that these uh, that these rules aren't arbitrary and capricious, that they were reached through sound decision making. And we've written stories questioning whether that was actually done. And they also have to prove that these rules don't defy immigration law, which generally calls on ICE to arrest illegal immigrants that it comes in contact with and to try to deport them. It doesn't mean they have to do that for everybody, but that has to be the the general use of the money that Congress has given it. And so that the math I was talking about earlier, the fact that they have the same resources, uh, they're only arresting one quarter of the number of people they used to be able to arrest with that money, and, and they're actually deporting even fewer than that. That Those really stark numbers are going to, they're, they're going to be a hurdle that the, uh, the Biden administration is going to have to explain. You know, one other interesting thing about this, we're now middle of January, and ICE still has not actually released it's fiscal year 2021 numbers. Usually the latest they've ever been released before was, uh, I actually remember shopping with my, uh, my, my nieces and nephews on uh, December 30th, I believe it was one year when they released it. Uh, you know, we're, we're now 15 days past that, essentially. This is the latest that they've, uh, that they've ever released these numbers, and there's no indication that they're coming. Those numbers would tell us a lot more about ICE's enforcement operations that we don't know. ICE used to be a lot more transparent about this stuff, and they've gone underground with some very important data just as we're entering this trial. So there's something to be aware of. 
Yeah. I'm going to stay with the immigration theme for a minute. Visa program for illegal immigrant crime victims riddled with fraud. They're known as U visas. What are they and what do they do to help us? They are supposed to be given to victims of crime, generally illegal immigrants. You know, if you are a a legal migrant whose time is likely to be up, you could also apply for it. But it's very popular among illegal immigrants because, you said it's called the U visa, and it offers a four-year protection. But it also, at the end of that four years, offers you the chance at a pathway to citizenship, sort of that holy grail for illegal immigrants. So it's proved very popular for illegal immigrants to apply for, so much so that the law only allows 10,000 to be granted every year. The government, Homeland Security, is getting you know, four, five, six times that many applications in peak years a few years ago. And the current backlog is, I believe it's nearly 300,000 cases that, that are in the backlog right now. So take at least 15 years to work through the cases that are already in there, much less to do any new cases that arrive over those 15 years. That's how popular this, this is. The Biden administration actually made it even more popular over last summer because they said that, hey, if you apply and clear you through an initial check, we're going to give you a work permit that used to come much later in the process. But a work permit is basically, uh, you know, citizenship is the holy grail. The work permit is just below that. That's that, that basically allows folks to stay generally not going to be deported. And it gives them permission to work legally. And that, you know, once they have that work permit, they're actually entitled to some taxpayer benefits. The Biden administration made this even more attractive to illegal immigrants to apply for. So we expect to see an increase in more cases there. Now, the, what the Inspector General found it's interesting. They found a little bit of fraud themselves, but their main finding was that Homeland Security has done four internal reviews over the last decade, spotting fraud on its own and hasn't taken any steps to correct that fraud. And the report was pretty scathing, right? They they, they said Homeland Security found instances where a police were... So, one quick thing about this. In order to prove that you are a victim, you're supposed to go to the, your, your police department and get them to, you know, presumably you've reported the crime. And then you ask your police department to fill out a form certifying that you were a victim of this crime. And they're supposed to say, and you're helping them pursue the case uh, so that, you know, so the, the point of the visa, or one point of the visa is to help police track down and prosecute criminals who committed crimes against illegal immigrants or non-citizens. The police are supposed to certify that you are that victim and are helping out. Some police were selling fake certifications. Other times, illegal immigrants or their lawyers were forging the certifications, or when they had a real certification, they would then take it and alter it and make it seem like the crime was worse than it actually was, basically trying to enhance their case to get the Homeland Security to approve their case. The inspector general didn't take a guess at how widespread that fraud was, but it did have identified a number of different instances where it came up with fraudulent documents. And USCIS, the agency that deals with this, had all these concerns about fraud itself. So much so that at one point, the agency's fraud people said they didn't have confidence in any certifications filed after about 2017 or so, just because police were telling them, hey, we're signing this stuff because because we don't want to face lawsuits. What what the immigrants put in front of us, we're just signing, we're rubber stamping. So say, we're not putting our imprimatur on it, we're literally just putting a signature. It's troubling stuff. Now, having said all that, the director of the agency wrote a an incendiary response back to Inspector General saying, Saying that they botched the law, that they botched the uh, the investigation, and basically uh, saying they, they just don't believe the inspector general's finding. All right, before I let you run today, what are you working on? There's a, a new report out that looks at guns that flow from the U.S. south of the border. So as, as the U.S. gets the surge of illegal immigrants from Mexico and Central America in particular, uh, Central American countries claim that, that, that they're ending up getting guns smuggled across their border from the U.S. and the government accountability office took a look at this and said you know, a couple of interesting findings. One is that, yeah, there are some guns being smuggled in, but about 50% of the guns that end up in four key Central American countries, Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, actually were exported legally to those countries, you know, to their military or to their police, and then basically got stolen somewhere along the way, it pr- likely in those countries, so diverted from legitimate purchases. And, and the other interesting thing is that the U.S. government 
doesn't really do a lot to combat those weapons. The Biden administration is trying to change that. But what we do is we pay for those countries to destroy those weapons. And over the last four years, American taxpayers have paid $3 million to destroy a thousand, I guess, 5,000 weapons across the, some of those countries. So an interesting perspective is as we deal with the surge of people, the countries that are sending many of those people say they're dealing with a, a surge of firearms from the U.S. Folks, you can read all of Stephen Dynan's stories at WashingtonTimes.com. As always, thank you, Stephen. My pleasure, Andy. Washington Times Assistant Managing editor Stephen Dynan. Thanks for joining me today and remember to receive a 50% discount on an annual digital subscription to the Washington Times. Go to WashingtonTimes.com slash Andy. You'll get 24-7 digital access to the Washington Times at 50% off. Again, go to WashingtonTimes.com slash A-N-D-Y. I'm Andy Parks. Have a great day.